So thank you very much for joining us again. I'd like to introduce our presenters, Dr. Kerry Bainan from RDP Law and Damon Rams from Wolfbury Cybersecurity, both peer-regarded leaders in their field. I'm really grateful for their time. They've got lots of tips to share with us, lots of things that I uh, and many other managing partners hadn't actually thought of. So that, that's why this event came um, into being. Um, and we have shared it out more widely. So it's not just lawyers attending, there's lots of professional service advisors as well. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Kerry, who's our first speaker. Thank you. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Um, I thought if I um, just start by saying why we're concerned about cybersecurity. Um, I'm not going to launch into um, a long analysis of the law, you'll be pleased to hear. But um, I'll mention um, the uh, General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. As you know, um, under the law, we've got to have in place appropriate organisational and technical measures to keep data safe. We've got our professional obligations as lawyers, of course, to keep confidentiality. Um, lots of contracts that we sign have um, confidentiality clauses in them. So really cybersecurity is particularly important when we're, we're working at home uh, in these current times. Um, you're probably aware from reading the news that um, uh, cyber criminal criminals are taking advantage of the coronavirus situation. They're sending out phishing emails, um, text messages, purporting to be um, advice around the coronavirus. Um, and of course, when we're working at home, um, if anyone clicks on these links, um, it can expose the organisation to uh, risk of harm. So what Damon and I want to do today is I'll talk about some of the governance measures, things that we can do from an organisational perspective, policies and procedures that we can put in place to make sure that we try to reduce the risk of a, of a cyber attack. And then Damon then is going to talk about some of the technical aspects um, and then uh, uh, we have a bit of Q&A at the end if anyone's got any questions. Um, okay, so from experience so far in terms of the organisations that, that we're hearing about, um, lots of people have had to, well they've either furloughed their staff or they've sent them um, home to work. So, and organisations have different structures and different home working capabilities. So some organisations have been able to supply their uh, workers with company uh, owned devices, so laptops and mobile phones. Other organisations haven't been able to do that. And so they've had to ask employees then to use their own devices. So there's an element of risk um, in both scenarios, but of course the, the risk level is different. Um, so if I start by talking about the organisations that have been fortunate enough to supply their employees with their laptops and with their mobile phones, um, that's great, but what we need to do is to make sure that there are clear lines of, um, clear lines really that employees will follow and adhere to. So that means documenting um, the working from home procedure. So things that people are doing are putting something in there saying, um, uh, if you've got, you've got company owned devices, you're not allowed to leave those devices unattended. You're not allowed to connect other things to them. So of course, if you've got your home printers, you can't connect your home printers to your company devices. Um, you've got to make sure that they're patched and they're up to date. Um, you've got to make sure that people can't over uh, see your, your screen, for example. So they're setting down the, the, the rules and compliance around looking after company devices. When you look at um, organisations that have had to basically say to their employees, you've got to work from home, um, but we need you to use your own devices, the threat landscape is very different. So the policies and procedures that they're putting in place there then would really be similar to the, the bring your own device uh, policy to work. Um, so it's you have uh, your device, you can connect remotely to our systems, um, but you know here's how you do it. And then you've also got to think about, um, you know, what happens if that device is lost or if that device is compromised? How can we, um, do we have any rights to go in and, and manage that device? Because you have to balance your employees' rights of privacy against the organization's rights to you know, uh, implement cybersecurity measures. So there are two very different threat landscapes. But what we have to do, as I said earlier, is make sure that we have um, clear policies to, to follow. Because as lawyers, we are, um, and professionals generally, we are a sitting target. You know, we are being targeted by criminals at the moment. And one of the defences that you will have to take if, if you're unlucky enough to, to suffer a cyber attack is, well, we thought about the risk landscape. We did what we could in the current circumstances. We made sure that our employees knew the rules. Um, and actually, we think that that was an appropriate response given where we were, the costs, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, it's not all just about uh, policies and procedures, of course. Um, it's also about if you're using new tech, uh, making sure that actually you're doing your due diligence on the supplier. Some tech is more secure than others, and I'm sure Damon will have a comment on that later. Um, and it's making sure as well that you do your data protection impact assessments, even if you've already put your employees back um, at home in a working environment, if you haven't done it yet, still do it. Because when you go through that process, you can identify potential risks and there might be some mitigations that you can put in place. At least if there is a cyber attack further down the line, you can produce your DPIA and say, well, look, we did what we could and we acted appropriately. Um, uh, the other things as well I would like to mention would be training. Just because we're working from home doesn't mean that we can't be training people about cybersecurity. I mean, we, we would have all been doing it anyway, but now is a timely reminder to pick up on some of those particular threats that we're seeing. So you can train your staff in many different ways. You can have webinars such as this. You know, it's really great. I'm using face-to-face um, -face, uh, video conferencing facilities, but even sending emails and guidance, even linking to articles, um, still really valuable. Um, it's really important that you do show that just because the workers are at home, you're not leaving them to it. You're still there supporting them, flagging the risks. Um, and of course, I suppose there's lots of free advice out there. I mean, Damon Services, he'll tell you about those shortly. Um, but you, you can go to the NCSC website for some free online business um, advice guidance. Um, they've also got a report there um, for the legal sector as well, which is quite interesting. So they looked at the legal sector, looked at what our threat levels were. Um, and produce a report that's quite worth well worth reading and circulating to your staff and employees if you can um and uh, the the sra as well i mean they issue their um they issue their guidance don't they on current threats and scams so from a legal perspective from the governance side i what i would say is look at how your your employees are working at home make sure that there are clear lines they know how to use company equipment they know how to use their own equipment you've really thought about what happens if there is an attack how can we make sure that we can get the data back you've put it all you've documented it all in policies and procedures you've done your risk assessments and you're still in touch with your staff you're still training them you're still highlighting the, the current threat landscape um, and I don't know if any of you saw the, the text message that's been going around. So, you know, did you receive the um, text message from the government where they said, oh, there's a coronavirus outbreak. Obviously, we'd like you to self-isolate. Um, Tarianne then uh, popped something up on their Twitter feed saying some people are also getting this message. Actually, the government didn't send it. Please don't click that link. That link is a, is a phishing uh, link. So there's lots of good guidance, but it's really important to stay on top of it. Carry on with your risk assessments. Regularly review it. Um, and if something happens, it's really important that you have in, in place your breach response procedure. So hopefully you had one anyway, but it's worth creating it now if you haven't, or even if you've got it, reviewing it in light of the, the home working environment. So who, does, who do employees get in touch with when there's an event? How are you going to, to respond to that threat? So those are my top tips for, for working from home from a governance perspective. Damon, do you want to say something on the technical aspects? Oh, there you go. You are unmuted by host. There you go. Can everybody hear me okay? Right. Fantastic. Right. So, yeah, thank you, Kerry. Um, so, the threat landscape now, from a cybersecurity point of view, has completely, everything has just been thrown out of the window completely. So, what we have is that we've all reverted back to our disaster recovery plans that we all put, had in place from last year and it says in the event of a global pandemic we've all got to work from home we all know what to do because of course that happened right so obviously it didn't um so our biggest problem that we've got is the speed that everything has been done here so if i give you an example i'm going to pick on zoom very quickly so there's been a lot of talk over the last couple of weeks about Zoom being insecure and various other things like that. So just to put this into perspective, in November, December and January, Zoom were taking on roughly around 130,000 users globally. In the, in the week that the UK announced that it was going into lockdown, Zoom's user base increased by 2 million in one week. So it went from 130,000 a month to 2 million in a week. Now, 
one of the things you can do as an organization, and if, especially if you're providing a software as a service in that environment, is you, you, you run as thin, thinly as possible. So you don't have a resource when you're taking on 130,000 people a month that can cope with 2 million in a week. And it almost becomes a denial of service attack then because how do companies, you know, software companies like Zoom, cope securely with taking that much more information and that much more data on? And that therein lies the problem completely for everything at the moment, is that how do organizations, law firms specifically, it's nothing new for law firms and, and partners to work from home. And there's the facility, it's been there for a long time now, quite able to work from home in the office for a day or two. No problem at all. All of a sudden now though, instead of three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten people, it's everyone, 50, 60 people, all trying to work from home. And systems haven't been designed to cope with that. Um, internal systems and other software. Look, you know we're going to have a problem when in the first week that we went into lockdown, Microsoft and Microsoft Teams fell over because it couldn't cope with the demand. Right? So, and when things fall over, that's quite often when the vulnerabilities occur. So I thought, because I love telling the stories, I thought I'd tell you a quick story about the lockdown. Uh, the first week of the lockdown, one of our clients, in fact, I would say one of our largest clients, um, based headquartered in Cardiff, um, they decided they had a couple of um, foreign offices that they were running that were exposed sooner than here. They decided that they were going to go into um, isolation. Everybody worked from home. As Kerry said, they all had BYOD, bring their own devices. So the staff went home, actually the office in the Philippines, went home, all operated from home. Within five hours, and this is no lie, within five hours, they had ransomware that had spread across their global enterprise, and they are still down today. And they're not going to be back up fully operating until the 30th of April. Um, because basically they had nothing in place. It was a panic, knee-jerk reaction. Send everybody home for everybody to use their computers, and um, there's the consequence. So the real problems with working from home, really, are uh, the length, the length of time. If I give you a great example of updates, so everybody has updates on their computers, and how most organizations will operate, they'll know that, well, user A um, has a laptop. He will be at the office, he could be at the office for three weeks at a time, but when he comes back in, as soon as he plugs into that corporate network, the updates will be pushed through. So that's how a lot of organizations operate with centrally managed updates. Well, that's not going to happen now. People aren't going to be coming back to the office. It could be till, you know, for a couple of months before people come back. So all of a sudden, IT departments and IT support now are going to have to work out a way of actually getting these computers updated because the updates are the important things, right? I mean, again, to use Zoom as an example, they've pushed out an update today to fix a couple of serious vulnerabilities in their systems that would allow people to take over, take over PCs, steal accounts. <coughs> Sorry, I must add as well, I do apologize. I've got a bit of a cough. I have been a victim of the virus and it's been three weeks now and I've just, I'm just left with this rather horrendous cough, so I do apologize. So updates are a really, a real big problem. So we need uh, companies need to understand and think about how they are going to manage those updates, especially over the next couple of coming months. And the same with things like um, all of a sudden home networks. So even if you have brought your laptop home and your laptop is all secure the day you bring it home, straight away you are plugging it into your home network. And gosh knows what lives on your home network. I live in a house, I've got four children. And those four children are an absolute nightmare. I, I don't want to know what they're doing after. In fact, I know everything they're doing all the time. It's their misfortune that they've got a father like me that works in an industry that I work in. But I know what I get blocked and I see blocked all the time. So lots of people won't know that. So the networks are almost like a, a little pandemic in themselves. There's viruses floating around everywhere, which is exactly what happened to the client a couple of weeks ago in the Philippines. Someone plugged into their network. They got infected through their network at home and then that caused the whole problem. So there's that isolation of home networking is gonna be really, really important and something we're gonna to have to get to grips with. But I think the, 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 the number one biggest problem that we're seeing at the moment is phishing. 
So Kerry mentioned it about the um, text earlier, but I'm sure lots of people have seen the phishing emails floating around around coronavirus, whether it's um, cure found, click here to find more information, latest stats, click here for more information, you know, whether it's a PDF, basically the, um, the cyber criminals, they're looking to use um, the coronavirus, they're preying on fear and they're using that as a delivery mechanism for whether for, for malware basically whether that's malware that will steal banking credentials whether it will install ransomware i mean they do this all the time you know at christmas we get dhl and amazon fishing floating around everywhere but this one now obviously it's got a global it's got global attention so they're using it so we did a, a fishing simulation for one of our clients this week because they were concerned about the, the their exposure. And out of the 365 staff, we, we just sent an email saying, basically, latest coronavirus information, click here. I will say as well that we did, an hour beforehand, we sent an email out saying, look out for coronavirus emails. They're gonna be floating around. Don't click on anything. If you wanna find information, go to the NHS and click on that. So then we left it an hour, sent an email, and 60% of the organization actually clicked on the link. 70% opened the email, 60% clicked on the email. So that's how easy it is for cyber criminals at the moment to gain a foothold into the system. So cyber awareness and understanding is more important than ever and tied into the fact that computers are slowly gonna become out of date because they're not getting updated properly because as we all know, the purpose of a phishing email is to put a piece of software on your computer. That piece of software will look for vulnerabilities on your system and vulnerabilities come when software is not updated. So it's a, a, big, a, a big opportunity for some criminals to get their foothold into things at the moment. So you know, on that cheery note, I mean, that is it really. That's, you know, there is a whole as I said, the threat landscape has completely changed now. So we need to um, we need to review it. We need to understand it, and we need to start putting in place um, steps and measures in place. It would have been lovely to have done this six months ago beforehand, so everybody knew where they were. But we haven't, and it isn't, and it never would have been. So that's fine. And then the final final thing I will say really quickly is people end users now are becoming resourceful which is a, a, the last thing you ever want, right? End users thinking, oh, I need to share something with somebody over there with a client or whatever. I'll just use this. And they're just pulling whatever they can from the internet and start sharing sensitive private data. And all of a sudden, that lovely sensitive data that, that we all knew where it was previously now is getting bandied around left, right, and center by, by end users because they're sort of free, right? They're running free with your data at the moment. So we do need to hold that in. It's a lot of education for users now. And I think the next month or two will be the, the time that we need to bear down on, on, on users to make sure that they understand the vulnerabilities. That's it. Can I just say, can I just come, can I just come in and sort of, can I just come in and say a perfect example of that, Damon, was in a paper today on the commander of the USS Theodore Roosevelt, who yeah. sent a who sent a communication to his friends because he had sailors that had COVID nineteen and the government were doing nothing about it. That got spread wise, widely, got put in the press, and he's obviously been relieved of his command. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, the problem is, I suppose, that we've. Um, been getting to grips with dealing with with moving everything to home working some firms have been having to furlough stuff there's all sorts of operational yeah. things that we've been dealing with and perhaps cyber security is, is ditched down right under the carpet in terms of priority um, and thinking oh well we've got people we've got systems in place from before and, and they'll work now um, is there anywhere that you um, that we can find quite easily in terms of advice on phishing scams what 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 the latest text or email scams have been or um, a link that, that is quite useful for law firms to share and not only within their organization, but also to support clients as well who might be finding the same issue. Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, there are, um, there, there's resources. Kerry mentioned the NCSC, which is the National Cybersecurity Center. 
they, 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 they provide a lot of information. Obviously, Kerry and I are um, co one of two of the co-founders of um, Cyber Wales, which is a resource as well. And I'm also on the board of the um, of Task Force Wales, which I mentioned to you earlier, which is a, um, uh, a DCMS and Welsh Government board that has been set up um, for dealing with things like the, um, the coronavirus business interruption loans that don't seem to be working very well at the moment, but other, other things as well, and advice on cyber and home working and protection, things like that. So that's taskforce.wales, which is a great resource as well. So there are, and, and companies like Wolf Green, my company, we, we push out a lot of information. And in fact, we're putting stuff together for our clients at the moment to help them understand some things that they need to do at home to, to, to combat a lot of the stuff that I said. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or um, need further signposting from either of the speakers? Feel free to unmute yourself or if you want me to do that for you. Hi there. Um, it's more of a, a comment. Um, our business, if you can hear me, this is, can I have a thumbs up if you can hear me? Um, our business is uh, an online learning business for the Chartered Institute of Legal Executives. So we've sort of a, a, a one step away. Um, and something that I have seen over a lot of time is, especially when learners who are working with our systems have problems getting in and they'll go, oh, you know, I can't get in. Can't. And they'll send me screenshots and it's amazing how many of the smaller law firms um, are running obsolete software. They're running PCs in their offices with Windows 7, Windows 8, and I'll go, well, that's the part of the problem you can't get in is because your software is now actually will not interact with anything because all of our stuff and lots of other people's stuff has been updated to the latest versions. Um, and I feel as though in a lot of smaller firms, the, the legal tech or tech generally is a very low priority. They, 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 they say, can't afford to spend that now. So they won't, it's working, don't worry about it. And now it's gonna come back and bite them because there's all these PCs and laptops that are maybe running obsolete. So even if you updated, but it's an old version of software, and that's what I see as, 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 a, as, as, as an, an outside person who deals with law firms. That's a really good point. I thought you were also going to add that there was screenshotting confidential information in the background and sending that to you, which... <laughs> no, 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 it's not, it's, it's not that. It's, it's, it is just, you can see the, 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 the software they're running and you go, that's, the, you, you need to upgrade all your, all your PCs, the latest software. Yeah, well, we've, we've actually had that this morning. There were um, two public sector employees who were trying to access Zoom. So I had to send them a link to um, access it via Chrome uh, because they didn't have the software. They wouldn't, it wouldn't cater for, for the app or, or some such reason. So, you know, it obviously is an issue for a lot of people but if you're trying to run a business and, and work with your colleagues remotely it's even more important isn't it really um no. can, can i make a point on that? can i make a point very quickly on that because what it's it's a fantastic point about legacy operating systems and legacy applications and one of the things and it's not just the small law firms as well because we deal with some of the larger ones as well but but where they've been complacent previously is the fact that they, they, these devices are um right down protected by like I'm gonna cough, there will be a sec. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um <clears throat> oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Right. Oh, dear me. Right. Um a lot of these law firms, even the larger ones, they're, um, oh, <clears throat> come back to me, I'll come back to you later, carry on, sorry. Can I just ask a question of Kerry then in the meantime, which is, which is relevant to this. Um, one of our law firms, they tried to get some laptops uh, to get their staff to work from home and they'd realised that in a week they'd gone up by £400. So they've gone and registered with some online system, it's £10 a licence a month, so that people working at home can access the office computers from home. And I can see Damien putting his hand to his head and that's exactly what I thought. Yeah, I think when you're selecting, if you're using any new tech, you've got to understand 
I suppose, what it does, make sure it does what it says it does, but also understand the integrity of the company that you're buying from. And before you do anything like that, you need, you have to do your risk assessment because there could be security gaps. And I think particularly as lawyers, we're going to be held to a higher standard of account to, uh, to account than other organizations because we should know what the law says. Um, so I would be def definitely looking to do those DPIAs. Um, it might be that there are things that you can put in place to, to make sure that that's an okay system to, to work to. But yeah, I think it's definitely, definitely risky and you definitely need to do your, your risk assessments. Right. I'm back and I'm not coughing. Yay. Right. So just very quickly, going back to that point, it is the case with the larger law firms. Um, they, they were complacent previously because those PCs that were maybe a bit more vulnerable were under layers of security which, okay, you can argue that they shouldn't have those devices like that, but you appreciate that they have got thousands of pounds worth of layers of tech protecting it. But now what they've done is taken those PCs and taken them out. So those layers of protection have gone because, you know, Mr. Smith has now got his Windows 7 PC plugged into his home network. You know? So it's a huge problem. It's, it's all been a huge knee-jerk knee -jerk reaction, right? That exactly, they, as Richard said, they, they, they're buying software for tech. 10 pound a month so they can remote it for their PCs. And it's, it's, it's shocking really. And this is where the fallout is going to be from it. I mean, you wouldn't want to be a certain criminal company that is currently selling remote access software, would you? Well, you probably would. There's probably some floating around. That's all I have to say. Right. Anyway, thank you. Sorry, it took so long.